and happy Freedom and Democracy Day to each of you. I'm Jeff Lightfoot, as Ian said, I'm the Director of Programs for Europe at the Center for International Private Enterprise, CIPE, one of the core institutes of the United States' National Endowment for Democracy, and have the pleasure of heading up CIPE's New Europe office based in Bratislava, Slovakia, just across town from our partners, friends, and co-hosts here at Globsec. I'm also a proud Atlantic Council alumni and a non-resident senior fellow with the council. On behalf of our co-hosts this morning, the Atlantic Council and Globsec, it's an honor to welcome you to today's Central Europe Week discussion on the topic of innovation as a tool for building economic resilience. Just a few weeks ago, this broad theme of innovation and resilience anchored the discussions at the Globsec Tatra Summit, which took place in the lovely Tatra Mountains of Slovakia. The conference focused heavily on Central Europe's economic recovery from the pandemic and how the region can take the next step in its economic development to move beyond a manufacturing economy toward an innovation economy. Much of the focus of the conference's panels looked at the imperative of the region to embrace the green transition and to digitize, leveraging historic support and funding from the European Union's Recovery and Resilience Plan to develop a new model of economic prosperity. Also discussed were more uh, technical questions around the reform agenda for the region to create a more welcoming environment for innovation in the region. For example, reforms to the education systems, to healthcare, greater investment in research and development from the public and private sector alike, and the need for greater women's participation in technology to achieve a more innovative economy. For those of you who are interested in a deeper dive of the topic of Central European innovation, I highly recommend that you check out the Globsec Tatra Summit's Insight Report, which dives into these issues in quite a bit more detail. And of course, the Atlantic Council's Future Europe Center has some great resources on their site as well. So as we dig into these issues, I'm delighted to introduce a very distinguished panel of leaders from the realm of public policy and the private sector to weigh in on this crucial topic to Central Europe's future. Joining me on the panel are Elena Kutsko, Vice President of Globsec and the head of the Globsec Policy Institute. Elena oversees policy development, research and programming in the areas of defense and security, the future of Europe, global order, technologies and society, and strategic communications. We're also honored to have the former Vice Chancellor of Austria, the former Finance Minister of Austria, and the current Chairman of Globsec, Wilhelm Multer. In his long and distinguished career in government and international institutions, he, among other distinguished roles, also served as Minister of Agriculture in Austria and as Vice President of the European Investment Bank. Also joining us is Mr. Paulius Vertelka, uh, the Public Policy Manager at Google, uh, based in Europe. He's a former director of Infobol and also worked as an expert on improving the investment climate at Invest Lithuania. And last but not least, we have Linda Zelina, founder and CEO of the International Sustainable Finance Center, an apolitical, impact-driven, and technical expertise-led think tank focusing on a range of sustainable finance options headquartered in Prague. So for today's panel, what I'll do is put some opening questions to the panelists to open the conversation and get us going, but we also wanna hear questions from you, the audience as well. You can submit your questions via the dedicated box if you're watching on the Atlantic Council's 2021 Central Europe Week webpage, or by commenting on YouTube and Twitter if you're watching on those platforms. We encourage those of you who are watching along virtually to engage on this topic via social media to use the hashtag Central Europe Week in your tweets about the event. And this event will be on the record and, and uh, streaming live, but the council will also have a recording of the event on their website. So with all that as a framing and introduction, I'd like to put the first question to Elena Kutsko, who is working with us today on a major national holiday. So kudos to you affirming uh, your status as a, certainly a very hard worker in the Slovak think tank sector. And greetings, Elena. You've written a lot about the intersection of security and technology, particularly issues like artificial intelligence and its implications for the transatlantic alliance. This theme, the panel of this theme explicitly links innovation, which I think a lot of people would think about as, an, as a purely economic issue, to the theme of resilience, which touches on a, a range of wider issues like security and even democratic governance. So from your perspective, what's the linkage between innovation and national security, particularly through this concept of resilience? And why is it that so many Central European governments are putting innovation at the heart of their economic and national security strategies? 
Thank you so much, Jeff, and thank you so much, our wonderful partners at the Atlantic Council for having this event with us today. And indeed, the timing is perfect. I think uh, freedom and democracy is actually very closely tied to our ability to innovate and ensure that in the future we can uphold our values. But thank you also so much for the question. I think the answer here can be rather short. The pandemic definitely taught us to think about national security and resilience in much broader terms and in very interconnected terms. This trend definitely was visible before the pandemic, but COVID-19 in a way finished the job in conceptualizing the thinking and speeding up the implementation of this thinking. When Jeff, you were mentioning that innovation for most people is an issue of economic development and resilience, during the past years, we learned to know that uh, security is now in, uh, in many ways inseparable from our economic development and our ability to project our prosperity and security in the future as well. So innovation is now closely embedded in both our economic resilience strategies and national security strategies. Central Europe, as other parts of the world, understand very well right now that the extent to which a country is powerful and can dominate or navigate the international global order seems to be inextricably linked to the country's ability to innovate or and or depends what you can do adopt emerging technologies. So all countries are currently vying for excellence in technologies that could give them a strategic advantage. And the range of these areas is broader and broader. It starts from everything of, uh, that relates to communications, energy, artificial intelligence, surveillance, but it currently, especially during the pandemic, extends to medicine, manufacturing, and increasingly to military technologies. We know that NATO is um, working now on the new strategic concept that would put also innovation at the core to make sure that uh, uh, we are able to defend ourselves uh, in all domains that start from uh, cybersecurity to our ability to communicate and defend ourselves, again, the uh, uh, developments and the information, malign information spread in cyberspace as well. But Central Europe has a very important historical context and hence rather uh, unique internal and external drivers that made sure that innovation is currently at the core of our thinking. Some of these drivers started long before the pandemic, but definitely the pandemic did help us to articulate them and understand them even better. So I will mention two internal and two external drivers. Internally, uh, we know that our economic model is very outdated. And uh, Jeff very uh, masterfully explained the connection and how we try to work on it. But in one sentence, we know that the economic model that we relied upon that was based on manufacturing and low labor cost is outdated and the reforms are necessary. And we are running out of time to start implementing this strategy. But the second, uh, second driver uh, is connected to the role that the private sector plays in the region in terms of the economic development, but also the role that private sector plays in innovation, be it in civilian sector or in the security sector. If we look at the Western world today, what we observe is the shift from innovation being done in the public sector uh, to innovation that is being done and driven primarily by the private sector. Central European countries have never been very big on uh, innovating in the public sector simply because we're pretty small and do not have big budgets to invest in the cutting edge developments or to own the innovation. And so the public sector was not even the leader of integrating the innovation. So from that perspective, the fact that the innovation today is coming from the, public from the private sector is a benefit and an advantage for the region that has been reliant on small and medium enterprises to drive its uh, economic development in the past as well. But on the other hand, this is also a vulnerability. Also, although there is some homegrown innovation, it is dwarfed in comparison with innovation that is coming from foreign or multinational companies. And inevitably, it adds a little bit of uncertainty about our ability to predict in which direction it will be going in the future. And when it comes to external drivers of putting innovation at the core of security and economic strategies, is uh, the first one is the uh, geopolitical competition in the area of technology and digital. 
the region is very well aware of it, but the region also remembers its history very well. Uh, Central Europe has been a geopolitical playground for decades and centuries. And certain scenarios pertaining to technological and global power competition and its implications for the region make the countries here very nervous. For example, let's take, Moscow, let's take Moscow's advances, which are increasingly marked by the manipulation of the digital information space and the use of cyber attacks and spyware. These advances have laid bare our original technological vulnerabilities, but also vulnerabilities in the entire Western world. And the second factor that's again very closely connected to what's been happening in the past years due to COVID-19 pandemic is the disruption in the supply chains in all possible sectors. The region is very deeply embedded in supply chains. Uh, that was the key to its prosperity. But now we increasingly see vulnerabilities that are associated with it. We understand better that interdependence, though beneficial, would need to be combined with some kind of diversification to minimize risk. And I will stop here and hope we can elaborate a bit more later. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Elaine. And maybe just to sort of follow up with one question that I think leads nicely, or builds nicely upon that in, in this sort of context of, of geopolitical competition. Uh, my sense was you know, that, that COVID was a sort of a wake up call, but even before that, um, that the, the Trump administration for the shortcomings one could identify of, of some aspects or critiques of perhaps engagement on the transatlantic side or that one often hears at least, uh, worked very aggressively with Central Europe uh, as a starting point and within NATO to try to sort of raise awareness around uh, some of the risks of a dependence on Chinese technology. And we had seen in Central Europe, uh, the Chinese, particularly Huawei had made pretty rapid advances and was providing a solution and a set of pricing that was difficult for a lot of Central European governments to say no to as they were attempting to rapidly digitize and build out you know, 4G and later 5G um, networks. And then the Trump administration sort of helped get some MOUs around a clean path and things like that. And now you're seeing, I think a lot in the countries in the region trying to walk back that dependency on China. Um, but then you're also seeing some voices within the European Union say that Europe needs to be more autonomous also from the US in terms of uh, data sovereignty and innovation and things like that. How realistic is it from a Central European perspective for Europe to look to develop a robust innovation econ economy autonomously, um, breaking some linkages with China or perhaps even being more autonomous from the US? Is that a realistic vision? Um, and might this offer opportunities? And the Taiwanese foreign minister was making the rounds through Central Europe about two weeks ago, stopping at GlobeSec, if I recall. Uh, does this offer opportunities for Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, Israel, other democracies to perhaps fill that void? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Definitely, Central Europe has to look at several important partners that it has. One of them is the European Union, and another one is, of course, the United States. The, uh, it's the development not just in the region, but it's more a European drive that the EU is trying to develop its own model that would... Uh, work very closely with the United States, with whom we're aligned in terms of values, and we want to continue working closely together in terms of developing standards that will uphold these values, but also who is a very important security provider. So this vision also penetrates the Central European countries as well. But as you rightly pointed out, there are certain uh, wariness and certain uh, understanding that any uh, potential more autonomous uh, uh, structures in the region will take some time. So the region is not very eager to jump on the ship straight away, simply because it knows that we're now very much dependent on actually both the United States and China in certain areas to be able to afford for ourselves some totally autonomous model. So what the region prefers to see is more incremental developments and importantly, doing the unfinished business within the European Union, like solidifying our digital single market that would spearhead the uh, economic development in the region as well. When it comes to China, definitely over the past years, there has been increased awareness about the security implications that certain technologies coming from China might have, especially for the region but also increased awareness about the fact that the Chinese technologies that does not necessarily always come with, print, with the embedded standards that are aligned with our values. Plus, ex exactly because of the pandemic, we now have this awareness that we cannot over-align on China as the only source of everything that comes through our supply chains. When it comes to the United States, 
Again, United States is the most important security provider for the region, and for Central Europeans, security will be much more important than any trade uncertainties, uh, let's say, with the United States. So definitely the region will prefer to align with the U.S. in the future, also on all things that concern technological developments. That said, there is also a dose of pragmatism in the region. We know that we do rely on the American companies uh, that bring the technological development in the region, that are based in the region, or uh, that operate in the region. And uh, these uh, uh, private partners also key for our technological development as well. So this combination of security concerns plus pragmatic understanding of how much ahead the United States is of Europe in terms of technological development also play its important role in Central European strategies. When it comes to smaller countries, uh, definitely this is an opportunity for the region and we already see some steps in this direction. And I'm talking here about smaller technologically agile democracies like South Korea, Japan, Israel, or Taiwan. And there are several opportunities here. First, the region knows that uh, it can learn a lot from these countries in terms of developing its economic model. We can learn how to do innovation and technolo technological development, how to do state-driven mission investments, how to do integration of innovation by agile uh, public and private sector as well. We can learn a lot and exchange thoughts on how to do talent management and the human resources in the area of um, uh, technology. But this is also important for us from the point of view of this attempt to diversify a little bit from China as the sole source uh, of uh, uh, manufacturing or uh, rare earth materials and so on. While also the region is increasingly interested in working with this small democracies or smaller democracies is that exactly because they're democracies and we're aligned with them on principles and values and standards. And because they're probably smaller size, there is a, a mutual interest uh, of them to be more closely present in the region and uh, to do business with the region. Thanks, Elena. I'd like to, uh, you just talked about cooperation with democracies outside the region. I'd like to ask the vice chancellor uh, to talk a little bit about his vision for greater collaboration among the countries within the region. And, and Mr. Uh, Vice Chancellor, at the at the Globesec Tatra Forum, uh, you outlined with a great deal of passion a vision for uh, Danube Tech Valley and the need for greater regional cooperation among the smaller states of Central Europe to strengthen collaboration in some pretty concrete ways that can help foster greater innovation and prosperity in the region. We just heard, you know, uh, Ian Brzezinski and the panelists talk about the Three Cs Initiative, which is somewhat of a different concept with a bit of a different goal. Can you talk about the Danube Tech Valley, uh, the vision behind it, how you think it can foster a culture, uh, a greater uh, set of innovative economies in the region, and also how it might exist in complement with other initiatives, perhaps like 3Cs? Well, Jeff, you started quite interestingly by saying the pandemic was a wake up call, but at the same time, you're absolutely right. We have a lot of developments that are even more tricky than the current situation. Is it uh, the issue of climate change? Is it the issue of digitizing economy or society? Is it the issue of aging society? Is it the issue of strategic autonomy? Uh, you can name it. And for all of these things, the key issue for me is simply to, 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 to tackle the challenges in a proper way is simply make change happen. You cannot continue like we did over the last decades. We need to do it differently, not just better. And this is the, that's, that's the definition of innovation. And the key issue for me here is in this region specifically, you need to have, first of all, the readiness for innovation and the willingness for innovation. And this means for me that innovation is not an economic concept. It's not a technical concept. It's a real political concept. It's a concept that is an issue for the whole society. That means it's a societal issue and a societal challenge. Innovation is key to make things really happen. That's the first thing. The second thing is in this region specifically, one of the weaknesses amongst many is we do not have the ecosystem i would say in a size that 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 matters for innovation we need to go cross border 
If you have just national approaches in such small economies, to be quite honest, this makes no sense. Therefore, we need two things. The one is we need way more, more than two. First of all, we need a strong push for single market initiatives. Because Europe still is, compared to the global players, a small continent. But if you divide this small continent into small pieces, this makes no sense. Single market is one issue. Second issue is regional cooperation, because ecosystems, specifically on innovation, are getting way beyond national borders. And here in Central Europe, we do have exactly this, I would say, center for innovation alongside the river Danube. This is something that really matters. You can start from South Germany and go down to the Black Sea and integrate Serbia, and you have really a, a wonderful ecosystem. If we really overcome these national bur uh, boundaries and create such a, 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 an ecosystem, would be great. And the third key element, and this is also something that is uh, driving this tech Danube Valley idea is, beyond building the network of accelerators, incubators, beyond building the network of research centers, universities. We have to create also a capital market in this region, simply to what Alena had rightly said, to, to integrate and to invite the private sector. Because this is one of the, the, the real challenges in this region. This region has no tradition in integrating the private sector and inviting the, the private sector to do, let's say, not just business, but also to drive innovation. There is no capital market existing. There is no venture capital market existing really in this region. And therefore, to, to attract the private sector is the third key element. That means we need this ecosystem on the regional level. We need the strong push from the single market, but we need as a third key element, the integration of the private of the private sector. And here, to be quite honest, I see one of the current weaknesses. There is so many money flooded into the market from ECB, but also from EU budget, that sometimes for governments, it's cheaper to use this money or it's easier to use this money uh, compared to the invitation to the private sector. And for me, the key issue, therefore, and this Tech Danube Valley could be also a driver for that is to blend the public sources with the private initiative. And this is for me the key, the key element uh, for, for doing so. Maybe one last sentence. Yes, we need competition also amongst the global players. That's very true, so. But on the other hand, we need cooperation. And maybe we should invent a new word that's called co-petition, because this partnership between public and private, this partnership between uh, countries in the Central European region, the partnership also with the transatlantic partners, the partnership with other innovators in, in the global sphere, like, like Taiwan, you mentioned, this is for me key. Therefore, yes, competition is okay. Cooperation at the same time. Let's cope with it. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chancellor. Uh, that's a really interesting concept. And I think it, it really gets to some of the complexity uh, that a lot of the governments in the private sector are really facing and trying to wrestle with some of these macro challenges that you outlined at the outset of your comments. And maybe we can come back to you at some point and talk about the Austrian experience because in looking at the Globespec reporting and data, you know, Austria is sort of sits heads and shoulders above the other countries in the region in terms of a lot of the environmental issues that can create an innovative uh, economy. So we might come back to that, but I wanted to sort of pick up on the thread of what you had to say, Mr. Vice Chancellor, and turn to Linda Zelena, because you obviously think a lot about the, the private sector's role in this, how to, how to actually you know, develop sustainable models of financing, particularly around uh, the two macro themes that stood out at the Tatra Forum was the green transition and the digital transition. From your perspective, and in, in also thinking about this challenge from the vice chancellor to create both competition and cooperation, what can be done to advance sustainable growth and innovation, in particular towards transition to a low carbon economy in Central Europe? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to Globsec and the Atlantic Council. I think it's a very interesting question. Um, everywhere you go, especially in the post COP26 world, you see 
climate on the agenda and sustainability on the agenda. And one of the greatest questions is also, of course, about innovation. So whether we can leverage innovation to somehow tackle climate crisis and avoid um, some sort of severe um, weather events. And I think from our work that we have been doing um, since maybe a year and a half, we're still quite a new think tank on the scene. But what we've seen is that actually in the Central and Eastern European region, sadly, in terms of the understanding of the issues and their interlinkages, we are maybe about a decade behind. And this is a good wake up call. We really need to take stock have a hard look in the mirror, both in the private sector and also in the public sector, and realize that actually we have been slightly asleep at the wheel. Um, this relates to the fact that, for example, when it comes to the EU taxonomy, we have a lot of misunderstandings and problems with the private sector saying this is a big burden. Well, it's not. For example, in this case, the taxonomy is just a dictionary, a list of things that are science-based activities, economic activities that you can undertake without compromising Paris Agreement. Very basic stuff. It's not a to-do list, to, to invest list. But there's a lot of fear. And I think that, number one, that the CE governments could do more proactively that we would like to see and we advocate for and we work on is actually to educate and create a better understanding of the opportunity landscape because sustainability is not going to go away and sustainability involves both environment and people let's not try and create a division here it's both without the people on board we're not going to have um, a transition but the transition will have to happen one way or another um, as i think uh, vice chancellor motor very uh, well said we need economies of scale and this is the direction Europe is going. This is the way all of the world is going. Biden administration has also put uh, actually climate at, um, at quite a central role. So finally, what we need to start working on is actually to see sustainability as a key uh, advantage point, a key thing for business models, which can help you guide innovation. Actually, when you look at the data, it's very interesting. Um, there's a McKinsey study that actually shows that uh, a large percentage of best innovations and R&D that has paid off, as has improved the bottom line and so on and so forth, is driven by sustainability considerations. So these are companies that made a conscious decision to try and figure out what, um, how can they improve their sustainability performance, whether it's social performance or environmental performance. And what did that do? That created savings and that also created value retention. For example, in real estate, if you start building buildings that have better energy efficiency, well, guess what? You can sell them for, uh, for, for better money and you can also rent them for higher rents. So there's a variety of opportunities that I think we need to um, focus on rather than just trying to scare people that this is going to be incredibly expensive. It will be, but see it as an investment. And I mean, I'm Latvian, so I come from the <laughs> Baltic region uh, originally, but um, I guess I've worked all across the world. And what I see in the CE is that you have very smart people. We do have these intangible assets that we could leverage better. We also can do a bit of leapfrogging because if you do a bigger upfront investment, in the long term, you could, you can even calculate these savings. And what people rarely like doing is also calculating the cost of inaction. And this is a real problem for a region that's embedded, as Elena pointed out, in supply chains, because that's going to be the next frontier. Post COP, everybody's going to start looking at supply chains. Also, we have reporting. So there's big changes in how we need to report. There's going to be European single access point, you have non financial reporting. Uh, SF, uh, RD, and so on and so forth. So we will have big changes there. So that means, guess what? With more transparency, we'll also come a better understanding of risk and bigger pressure to improve environmental performance. So I do think that there's a lot to be done and I would love to see the CE governments to, and also private sector actually, to be much more proactive and also look for expertise. So don't be scared. You can also find expertise that's not forbiddingly extensive. 
And once you actually start thinking and trying to figure out how to navigate this space, um, you can you can actually find a lot of help for free or resources for free. Um, so the main thing is just to get started. Maybe a follow on question to that, that that I can throw to you and the vice chancellor. Um, what we've been seeing here at, through our, our work at SIPE in the region is in trying to facilitate better dialogue between uh, municipal governments and the private sector. It's a lot of demand from business businesses at the local level, the municipal level in Central Europe to have a better dialogue with the public sector around these goals. There's big goals set by the European Union, by national governments, and it it frankly seems to be putting, there's there's a lack of transparency sometimes coming. Um, or, or the business doesn't feel like it understands those goals. And then a sense that um, some of these municipalities and small businesses are poorly prepared for this and are struggling to catch up. Am I right in seeing that gap? And what can be done to help bridge that gap? And I ask you that because of your particular expertise, but also perhaps the vice chancellor, because you, you were a very successful politician and you worked minister of agriculture would have had to have your finger on the pulse of, of local dynamics politically. So maybe you could take a, a crack at that question because I'm, I'm actually dialing in in this call from Central Slovakia where um, the discussions around these big macro issues feel very far from the reality of what people talk about. And it's very conscious to me of bridging that gap between these macro questions around climate transition and frankly, the economic issues that I hear people talk about when I travel around rural Central Europe. How do you bridge that transition both with the public sector and the private sector alike? Well. I would, I would say one of the key things is, do we have a common understanding on sustainability? And I was, I was creating or was contributing to the creation of a political concept in the 80s, mid of the 80s, we called it social market, social economic and ecologic market economy. Because the key question for me is sustainability is based on three pillars. First, economic strength, Second, social, let's say, balance. And third, long-lasting ecologic soundness. And for me, sometimes sustainability is just translated into green. No, it has to be economically successful first. Second, you need, let's say, also technical innovation to achieve the targets. That's not an anti-concept, it's a pro-concept. And what makes it what makes it from at least my experience key, we do have in Austria an economic structure where we have a lot of SMEs, specifically mid caps, and most of them are globally oriented. They have to succeed. They have to succeed on the global on the global market. And how can they do it? Simply to be competitive means be innovative. That's the key. That's the key thing for me. And last but not least, what I would add is, uh, where is one of the weaknesses is the educational system. We have, I would say, pros and cons. We have a system of vocational training, which means we have the entrepreneurial skills and 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 you know the entrepreneurial approach specifically also for the. For the for the workers and this, the, 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 the skilled the skilled people necessary for SMEs. On the level of universities, we are weak. That's an interesting experience for me. And therefore, I would go along the line in saying, okay, how can we incentivize also including the private sector into the educational system? Because for me, this is key, even if it is not a, a quick fix but in the long term, it's an absolute need. And here we can learn so much also from our transatlantic partners, our Asian partners, that is second to none. Thanks for that. You know, one of the interesting things that I've, I've talked to uh, in mid-sized cities around Slovakia, they have, the, the further that the cities are from a major university, the, the less economic development they've seen. There's some really fascinating maps I've seen here in Slovakia, where the education system, frankly, took a bit of a beating at the Globe Sec Top Reform is a, a real area in need for reform. But Linda, maybe I can come back to you on that question of bridging that gap on the on the climate transition between what you see at the local level and what you see at the national level and the European level. Um, thoughts on that and how to ensure that the that the transition is, is a just one and creates that kind of sustainable social balance that the Vice Chancellor spoke to. Um, yeah, I would agree completely about the large disconnect. Um, I think beginning of this year, we ran a series of workshops with actually cities and municipalities on how to issue a green bond. 
a very practical exercise. And it was very interesting to see how much appetite and interest there is for uh, cities and municipalities to figure out how to navigate this space. And the same on rising interest from business. And I think that the issue here is that, um, as I think the previous panel also mentioned, um, what we need is better signaling from the governments that you will have some certainty in terms of regulation. Because currently, sadly, these business models um, that exist currently are long-term unsustainable, but currently they make sense economically, right? Um, so that's why also the perception that it is very expensive to try and decarbonize. So we have a lot of work um, to be done there. What I think is very interesting is also the learning process. So education, yes, at Tatra Summit, there was a lot of anger about education systems and the lack of skills uh, that new businesses need. So that goes without saying, we need to improve that. But also I think um, what we've seen in other countries, so let's think, um, let's cast the net wider, not only the US, which is very good at it, but also Sweden and Denmark, for example, the private sector was the one that led the charge. And what we sometimes need is people to come up with solutions. So if you can craft a very clear toolkit or roadmap or something that somebody can use or ad adapt, that is a very good idea. People like that. They use that. That happened in the case of uh, Denmark with industry. They, they knew what they needed to decarbonize, so they proposed it. And actually, that eventually got adopted or at least uh, did get um, government buy-in. So I think um, from the business side, I would like people to start becoming a bit more market shapers rather than these rule takers. Um, and that would actually change the equation quite a lot. There is a lack of capacity. And that's one thing that I think we need to work on. And we also need to um, understand better what why people aren't using the opportunities that are there now. So for example, EU funding, not everybody is very good at tapping into that. And that's something that we can proactively work on, but that might need um, a bit more money getting channeled into it and a little bit more concerted effort. So it's not just everybody pulling at their end of the juve and things not changing in a sy systemic way. Thanks, Linda. I'd like to turn now and, and be very patient. I apologize for taking so long to get to Polly. It's a representative here from uh, the government affairs team at Google. I wanted to pull in this uh, private sector voice from US Big Tech and talk a little bit about um, you know, your perspective on the region. Google's made some pretty big, splashy investment an announcements in Poland, data centers, cloud, cloud centers, things like that. Um, you know, we've heard from private sector uh, major companies that this this region can be a challenge because you, the, as, as we heard from the vice chancellor, it's a series of small countries, and sometimes operating in that market can can be difficult for some of the big platforms. What is it that's in particular about Poland, the Polish environment? Is it the size and scale of the market? Is it the labor force? Can you talk about what it is that incentivized Google to make these big investments in Poland? And I don't I don't want to put you on the spot, but we did get a question coming in, in the chat about you know, uh, how others uh, are seeing the Danube Tech Valley. Is this something that you're familiar with from the Google side? So I know you all have engaged in the three C's concept, but how does this regional collaborative model appeal to, to a big US tech platform that's making investments in a fragmented region like Central Europe? Hi, well, thanks for having me. And um, well, certainly from Google's perspective, we look at the region on the regional level, right? So. First of all, it is much more appealing uh, uh, to see a group of countries working together uh, and see their potential um, than have a fragmented market from the business perspective. Um, so the, the the Google's investment that you've mentioned in Poland, I, you know, it it's a testament to the um, to the perspective the Central Eastern Europe has. Uh, it's naturally that it's natural that. Google's investments here are uh, driven by the market needs. So we're basically responding to the business opportunities. Um, and those are, in fact, driven uh, uh, by the tendencies, by the trends that we're seeing in, in the region. Um, and to illustrate that, I think um, a couple of years ago, McKinsey did a pretty good research uh, to put a number on the digital economy and its potential in the region. Uh, and that number was I believe 200 billion euros by 2025, if the region works together and focuses on growing its digital economy. Um, 
and we at Google, we do see that. Uh, we do see that potential. We do see uh, the interest uh, from the governments to, to work together um, to create digital single market, uh, to, uh, to adopt innovative, friendly regulations and policies. And that in turn, you know, creates, uh, creates business opportunities, both for us and the companies that we work with. And that's essentially the answer of how come uh, Google starts investing in this region. And we hope to see more of that in the near future. Well, thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, and I, I remember that McKinsey study, I think the Atlantic Council uh, played a big role in that. I think along with Google and the digital, the digital challengers, I think it was at the, that same study, I believe. Um, is that the same one? Yeah, maybe a follow-up question to you, and then maybe we can also get Elena's perspective on this. Exactly. Um, as a as a transatlantic, as a big U.S. company investing in uh, Central Europe, uh, where there's a lot of questions about where regulation is going to go, and Elena touched upon some of these themes already. Uh, certainly, there must be quite a bit of interest on the Google side, at, um, and among other big uh, platforms in the U.S. about the. Um, the Biden administration's discussions with the EU, the Transatlantic Technology and Trade Council meeting in September and statements around that. Um, it's good to see these, these kind of discussions happening about, rather than just uh, you know, uh, siloing and, and perhaps some harsh words or moving in different directions. But are you optimistic about the tenor of those discussions? And, and what would a company like Google hope to see emerge from those as a way of spurring greater investment and innovation in the region? E Yes, we are optimistic about that, and we do have uh, quite high hopes for it. Um, in the past, we've seen a lack of such dialogue uh, between EU and US uh, on how the tech regulation or policies should be shaped. Um, and that, of course, did not look promising at all because we were running in the direction of having a, you know, a fractured global system um, that is that would make, you know, uh, business operations really difficult. Uh, whether it's a small business or a big business, it wouldn't really matter. Um, so TTC is definitely you know, a, a step in the right direction. Now, when it comes to what, um, what we would like to see from it, where the list is probably quite lengthy, um, but some of the key areas where we think that major breakthroughs can be achieved uh, rather quickly are uh, concerning data flows, um, also data governance agreements, right, between the, between the, two, uh, between the two economies, um, competition and platform uh, rules um, and, and how that is, um, that is enacted on both sides of the Atlantic. So, you know, European uh, Union has kicked off uh, working on you know, the, 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 the alternative competition policy via the Digital Markets Act, also introduced uh, a revamp uh, um, uh, of, of, of platform rules via Digital Services Act. Um, and, and all of those, you know, ideally should be calibrated between the two regions. So we would end up with a coherent uh, uh, coherence pace um, uh, to innovate and benefit uh, the transatlantic community. Um, and that ultimately rests, you know, on common technology standards, for example, the development of artificial intelligence um, and what are for example the off-limits kind of applications of artificial intelligence like mass surveillance and things like that so within the ttc we do have opportunity to find common ground and develop values-based agreements and rules uh, for the future of, of of tech industry and the community that benefits from it yeah, thank you very much. And Elena, maybe uh, welcome your perspective on this as well. Are you optimistic or pessimistic? There's, there's still some pretty significant hurdles despite some of the good vibes uh, and some challenges, just differences of perspective, I think differences of culture. How optimistic are you about this transatlantic dialogue in the technology space? Um, this is sort of my first question to you. And then I think we've also got an interesting question that's come in from the audience that I'd welcome really everybody wrestling with about sort of this intersection between the emergence of uh, new technology and democratic values and how different countries in the region are handling this. But Elena, maybe you can chime in first on your level of optimism or pessimism about the transatlantic uh, dialogue taking place right now on technology and trade issues. I'm moderately optimistic, probably because I'm in general moderately optimistic about things, but this is a very important development. It's definitely much better than not having dialogue, but I also think that there is important 
in a way, ideological convergence on both sides of the Atlantic. There is important understanding that certain things need to be done, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, the uh, regulators having a more important role in trying to sort out what we need to do with the platforms, uh, to sort out what's happening on the platforms, but also in terms of making sure that uh, uh, with all respect to our privacy rights, we are able to work with data and make sure that data is available for companies that want to innovate and that want to use this data. So I think there is uh, a lot that uh, uh, we already have achieved in terms of trying to align a little bit. There are definitely hurdles, but I do think that they're overcomable. This is especially important for the region. Again, uh, going back to what Vili was saying about the importance of regional cooperation, for Slovakia, a country that is mostly a rounding error in most of the budgets of the companies, uh, it is very important to be at the table and uh, uh, the regional participation at the European level discussion, but also at the transatlantic level of discussion, is also a platform for the region to be heard, to uh, the way for us to express our concerns and maybe our ideas how to structure it in a better way. And thanks for that. And this is just, we've got about 10 minutes, a little bit more than 10 minutes left. We've got a couple of questions that are rolling in from the audience I'd like to turn to, but just a reminder to all of you tuning in, please chime in with those questions. So we got one um, question coming in online, that basically says new technology and AI, uh, developments also mean you know, emerging challenges to democracy as well. How are the different countries in the region dealing with these challenges coming from uh, tech, big tech, big data, AI? Um, you know, are countries looking for national solutions on this? I guess I might ask, are they looking for the EU to play a big role? Uh, to what degree are they looking to private sector to be a partner in these challenges? To what degree, and I know the, the private sector, what degree do they, do they look with some skepticism on that? Let me maybe start coming back to you, Elena, and then, and then, um, Perhaps Paulius in, in uh, a second, and the others who want to chime in, just please signal me as well, please. That's a very interesting question because uh, in most cases, at least the first things that come into mind is uh, how the big platforms and big companies are addressing these issues on the intersection of technologies and democracies. And most of these companies are neither located, the headquarters are not in Central Europe, nor are these companies too interested in talking directly to Central European countries that are a little bit too small for them to bother. That's why I think the countries in the region mostly are waiting for the finalization of the European level regulations and then following it to make sure that we're both aligned with the European partners, but also that there is some kind of a bargaining position or a negotiation position vis-a-vis -vis the bigger companies. I would... I would. Uh, Jeff, if you agree, yes, please. It, it would be rather brutal. I think the time of national solutions is over. If you have global challenges like uh, climate change, and if you have uh, the global dimension of data and the global dimension of digitizing, discussing at the same time national solutions is for me so obviously wrong. And this, will, this, this concept will fail. And one of the key issues, therefore, in the region is, on the one hand, to strengthen the European Union, but on the other hand, to play a positive driving, driving, let's say, attitude within the European Union as a region. And to be quite blunt also, if the European Union wants to have uh, or to be successful in, on strategic autonomy, we do not, I think we should never accept to be innovation takers. We should have the ambition to be innovation makers. And this needs exactly this regional dimension, because for being a driver of innovation, you have to have a size, as I've said. So therefore, I think it's key. We need this regional cooperation. Tech Daniel Valley is uh, the model we try. And secondly, we need this absolutely constructive partnership between public and private because we need each other. Otherwise, we cannot make it. Absolutely. Public-private collaboration is, is essential along with regional collaboration. Linda, I saw your hand up. Would you like to chime in on this question? either on that theme or, or, or getting to this theme of sort of uh, the, the question around sort of how uh, to, to deal with this intersection of de democracy and emerging technologies. Thank you. I think it's a, as Elena said, it's actually a very interesting question. Um, I think the, we do face a problem that while we do have these global challenges, sadly, 
um, national regulations and how money flows is still very national. And that, that plays a really big role. Um, I think that what we need is a much more strategic approach to innovation. Not every country is good on all aspects of uh, different technologies, right? So, for example, in Czech Republic, you have a strong industry and innovation around lasers. I mean, that is a competitive advantage. So that's something that might be worth exploring further and supporting more with more financing. Um, in that sense, I think we do have a, a patchwork of countries and patchwork of approaches. And I don't think necessarily that's a bad thing. We can experiment. And I think that's what people need to become a little bit more comfortable with. We live in a very uncertain world. That uncertainty is not going to go away. But we do need to not put all our eggs in one basket. We do need these different valleys. I love that there's a Danube Valley. There's a Zug Valley in, um, in Switzerland that we worked on very early on. We need these different approaches and let's see, maybe we can create some more interesting businesses or startups, right? You think about Skype, that was Estonia, you think about other ones. It can be done, it has been done before. Maybe let's just learn also from what worked then, how was it financed? And also address these pressures that often force small, interesting startups to sell out to big companies and just become absorbed. Because that is a really big problem with innovation. Um, and I think we can really learn a lot from the past. Maybe we don't uh, learn enough, but I, I do think that there's already quite interesting things happening. And uh, being in the EU is, um, is, does provide at least some certainty for investors, even if the countries have very different approaches. Thanks for that. And Paulius, I had seen your, your hand up before. I seem probably wanting to chime mm -hmm. in this question at the intersection of technology and democracy, there, there is a lot of actually really interesting leadership uh, that we see in the private sector here, actually trying to push back, not just the big platforms, but at smaller entities as well, pushing back on mis and disinformation. So it's really interesting to see the private sector in some cases struggle with this set of issues, but also going back on offense. I wonder if you can just chime in on, on a perspective from Google on this, what is really a central question right now, and I think in, in Europe and globally as well. Definitely. Well, um, first of all, I would would like to make sure that the message gets across and the fact that I don't think there is a country too small for big companies to talk to about the intersection of technologies um, and democracy. Um, yes, it makes it definitely easier uh, uh, to, to, to talk to groups, um, um, but I, I think at this important stage, um, no big company uh, is uh, has the luxury of ignoring uh, of ignoring thoughts and ideas and concerns coming from even even the smallest countries, um, and in fact, at Google, we we do engage directly uh, with policymakers that do think about these matters and and have and have thoughts and concerns to share. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's it's also I, I'd like to agree with the vice chancellor uh, who said that you know the time for unilateral kind of decisions is over, um, and. I'd like to just encourage that, yes, like the formats like TTC or the three, three C's uh, initiative, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, forum is, is a great place to discuss these matters and come up with more multilateral kind of positions and views um, that we can, we can all agree on, um, you know, as communities uh, and find the solutions that work best uh, for everybody. Got about five minutes left, and we got a really good question from the audience that I think aligns well with everybody's thematic interest in this panel and with the missions of both Globe Second and the Atlantic Council. Um, and the question is this: We're talking a lot about throughout Central Europe Week about Central Euro European U.S. connections and collaboration during this wider conference. So, what more can the U.S. be doing um, in and around this region to support innovation and investment? With U.S. being such an important hub of innovation, working together with the public and the private sector in the region. And ask each of the panelists to, to weigh in on this. You know, we heard just at the last session, Ian Brzezinski talk about the pledges at least that the US had made around three season initiative. We see our ambassador here in Slovakia has made innovation and entrepreneurship a priority. We have these legacy enterprise funds that are really still remain very active in trying to bring budding entrepreneurs to the US. So we see some interesting models of that already, but what more might be done uh, in the future that is, as we sort of close this panel um, let me maybe start with you, Elena, and then we can we can move on down the line. I think, Jeff, actually, that you being uh, uh, present in Slovakia as an organization actually is part of what the U.S. can be doing and is already doing. 
But I want to highlight one more element, and that goes back to our discussion on the human capital and the a talent management. What we also try to do within the Danube Tech Valley is to make sure that there is regional collaboration, but also potentially transatlantic collaboration on this aspect. What I mean specifically is uh, uh, partnerships with the research institutions or with the innovation centers across the Atlantic. Already there are some developments, for example, individual universities from the US, uh, including MIT of Harvard, have individual partnerships uh, with the Slovak universities or Austrian universities and so on. But what we're trying to do is to make it more of a systemic manner uh, where uh, there is platforms for collaborations for people in the region in terms of the R&D, but also educational sector with the American institutions that are done rather systematically and that are very easy to access. Linda, I wondered if I could get you to chime in next, perhaps looking at this from the you know, the sustainable uh, environmental side of this, uh, that's presently a priority from the US administration. I don't know if we know that it, if it will be in two or three years, but that's that's a little bit the back and forth we have in US policy today. How might the US uh, help support uh, greater innovation, perhaps in the climate transition uh, here in Central Europe? Well, I think just setting it out as one of the strategic priorities would already send a very, very strong signal because, um, in a lot of these cases, people are trying to see what will be the next big thing and realistically um, how it's all going in terms of um, mega trends. We have digitalization and we have sustainability and climate. So I think in general, we should be trying to marry the two trends and figure out how do we leverage uh, improved digitalization, which to be honest is not still good enough in Central Europe. We have a lot of work to do and also do talk more and figure out how to do energy transition because electrification is going to be super important for smart cities, smart grids, smart everything, right? Um, but I think sustainability needs to be that thread that goes through it because that creates a competitive advantage and you can sell it and then you rely on hopefully domestically created technologies and businesses, which is a big worry in the region. We don't want to be spending all our money on somebody else's uh, <laughs> solutions. Maybe we can also help each other and create some um, local companies that um, have some additional know-how. But I do think that US and um, Central European collaboration can uh, yield some very tangible outcomes if it, um, if it prioritizes things that are future-proof. Thanks very much, Linda. We are just about one minute left, so I wonder if I had just very brief thoughts if, if the Vice Chancellor or Paulius uh, wanted to weigh in, and, and then we'll bring this to a close. Well, I, would, I would fully agree on, 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 on cooperating on research and universities, and I would add two elements. The one is multilateralism. US is back on the, on the map. And I find this extremely important because if you think in the long run, it's about standards, it's about, it's about rules on the global level. If Europe and the US is cooperating on this matter, it's key. And another element would be cybersecurity. This is something that matters, specifically also from the aspect of a market-driven uh, economy that's based on democracy. And this, uh, this is uh, these two issues, multilateralism and cybersecurity, I would add. I'm gonna just stop here and bring this panel to a close because I know we've, we've gotten to the five o'clock hour, so apologies, Paulius, but I, somebody once told me as a, as a moderator, you have one job and it's to bring things to a close mm -hmm. on time. And so I'm gonna try to do that in respect for um, our panelists uh, and our audience. We wanna just give a big thank you to Elena, to Paulius, to Linda, and to the vice chancellor for joining us for a really, I think, a really rich and enlightening discussion that feeds off very nicely from the really rich content that we had at the Tatra Forum. Uh, on behalf of the Atlantic Council and GlobeSec, thanks to each of you uh, in the audience for joining. Please stay tuned for additional content uh, in the Atlantic Council Central Europe Week, which will continue tomorrow with a discussion you do not want to miss with the leader of the uh, Hungarian opposition, Peter Markizai, and a discussion around um, for Central Europe Week around the theme of transatlantic defense. So, uh, with that, I will bring this to a close and wish you a good night for those of you here in Europe and a good day for those of you in North America. Thank you and goodbye.